We're going to start the session. First of all, I'd like to thank the organization and the technical team for their efforts to make this event possible. Now, this afternoon, we're going to discuss issues to do with data protection, uh, legislation, and regulation on the subject. And we'll also touch upon technical issues like the limits and potentials. These are all essential matters when it comes to creating databases which might include delicate, sensitive information. And there is discussion about how to uh, proceed with these personal details. For this, we have three experts on the matter. And uh, of course, we have limited time. The idea for the session is that each of the speaker will have about 15 minutes. And then I'm sure we'll have an interesting Q&A session at the end so that we can hear everybody's voice. So I'm going to give the floor first to Ari Schraver. Let me introduce him. He's a lawyer. He's an expert on data protection. He's got a degree in law from the University of Cambridge and London. Also studied a master's degree at Stanford. Through Mike Booth, he acts as responsible for data protection for many organizations, amongst which advertising companies, biomedical companies, tourism companies, or governmental organizations, universities, historical institutions, amongst others. I'm sure he can tell us more about it. Ari also has several certifications on data protection and privacy, and he's published in journals such as Oxford Data Protection Journal or Journal of Data Protection Policies, amongst others. Ari, whenever you want. Thank you. That's better. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Celeste. I'd like to start with a little personal dimension. The man in the picture is my great-grandfather. His name was David Weinstock. He was taken to Buchenwald in September 1939. He was a denaturalized Polish citizen living in Austria, meaning he had lost his citizenship. He, was, he had it rescinded. His citizenship was taken away, and together with 1,050 other Polish men living in Vienna, he was taken to Buchenwald. Of that group, 440 were taken to the Austrian Museum of Anthropology, and there they were photographed and measured. And what you see here in the picture is his skull being measured. It, it's painful to look at, just to, to think of a dignified man, an educated man, a human, he's being measured here for posterity, for history, for pseudoscience. Why do I share this picture? Um, of the 440 men taken to the, uh, it was actually in the stadium, th that's where they were held while they were measured and photographed, 26 survived. So that's 5% of that group survived the Holocaust. He wasn't among them. He died two weeks after this picture was taken. He was murdered in Buchenwald. Now, why do I mention this? First of all, I have some skin in the game. Um, me memory and uh, history and justice is, uh, is live for me. My father is named for him. But more importantly, it goes to my first general point that I would like to make, and that is data that enables atrocity and that enables genocide and murder and imprisonment and all the terrible things that we're thinking about here today is also a part often, as you all know, of the memory and the history and the justice and the healing. And what we see many times is that the same data becomes a double-edged sword. It is used as part of the trustee and it can be reused, recaptured, re-owned taken control of and used as part of the healing. 
Uh, this is very emotional for, for me, for my whole family, for a lot of people. He has about 300 descendants alive today. Um, okay, I'm not here to talk about healing. I'm here to talk about data protection, so I'm going to get to that. So the first point I want to make, and I'm going to elaborate on that presently, is the, the dual use of data. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to share the slides. You're welcome to take pictures. I'm happy to share the slides with whoever's interested afterwards. In uh, 2016, maybe 2017, the Irish Data Protection Commission um, undertook a project to try and educate youth, children, about data protection. Why is it important? Children didn't really understand what that's about. What's privacy? What's data protection? Who cares? And the Irish DPC, the Data Protection Commission, produced a brochure, a kind of material for teachers to teach in schools why is data protection important. This is one of the materials that they shared. It's a screenshot, as you can see, for those who can't read. How did the Holocaust occur on such a massive scale? How did the Nazi authorities know exactly who was Jewish? How were the Jews captured? How did the Third Reich identify popular Jewish residential areas? So, they're presenting the importance of all these questions, and the answer is data. Excuse me, data. Now, th that's true in a sense. Uh, the fuller answer is because Dutch people delivered them, betrayed them, arrested them, put them in Dutch, in Amersfoort and Vesterbork, which were built by Dutch companies, on Dutch trains driven by Dutch drivers, Dutch police rounded up almost everyone, 89% uh, of Dutch jury. But for now, it's very convenient, of course, to blame the data. That's what uh, David Fraser calls masking. <laughs> Dutch people didn't kill Dutch Jews. Even Germans didn't kill Dutch Jews. It was data that killed Dutch Jews, right? That's what this looks like. Okay, so it is scary. This, is, this educates Irish children about data. I, I get that. That makes sense. And of course, the most famous face of Dutch jury, probably the most famous victim of the Holocaust at all, is Anne Frank. The data cutting two ways, though, is, um, and this is kind of an really a prefatory remark about why we have this tension between data protection and, I know my, my colleagues here on the panel will be speaking later about the, the tension between forgetting and remembering. When we look at the data being systematically destroyed in the Holocaust, this was a part of the atrocity. Rudolf Hess, commandant of Auschwitz, details in his autobiographical, I uh, don't know what to call it, autobiography, diary, uh, before he was uh, hanged, he details the systematic destruction of data after every big action to prevent memory, to prevent justice. They would systematically destroy all the data that they could. That's why it's so hard to get an exact number or even something approximating an exact number of victims or their names. We heard from uh, Professor from Alexander Avraham at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem has today, uh, I'll, I'll just give you the example of my own great grandfather whom we saw a picture of. He has three entries in Yad Vashem as far as we can tell. It's impossible to triangulate names, it's impossible to triangulate data. We don't know. A another extreme example of the difficulty of justice and memory when there is no data, when the data is not reclaimed, is Belzech. 600,000 people were murdered at Belzec, approximately. There were two survivors. Rudolf Reda was killed, murdered in 1946. Chaim Hirschman was the only survivor who could testify at any trials for Belzec. And that's why Joseph Oberhauser, the commandant of Belzec, he was tried in the 1960s. There was one person, 600,000 people slaughtered. One person was ever convicted of anything there. And that was assisted murder, assistance to murder. So I'm going to finish this kind of chapter, this notion of data being a double-edged sword with this picture. I'll stay with Dutch jury for now. What you see here is the following. This is Karl Groger. He's in Wehrmacht uniform here, as you see. He was discovered to have been to be one quarter Jewish, so he was released from the Wehrmacht. And then he promptly became a Dutch resistance fighter. 27th of March, 1943, he and 11 friends from the resistance did this. What you see is a room in the Dutch municipality uh, data section, uh, 
uh, archive, uh, uh, registry, the population registry, and they destroyed the room. You see, they, they, they burnt it, they firebombed it, and they actually paid off the firefighters to flood it afterwards, to ruin it, because Dutch Jewry was being um, slaughtered based on, on data. It was the easiest thing in the world to go and find Jews because Jacob Lentz, long story, whoever's interested, the, 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 the registry was full and included details of who's Jewish. So the Germans didn't actually have to go looking for anyone. They just gave a list to the municipality and said, deliver these people, and it was done. They bombed this room, and that was very effective, except it was not effective at all because a few rooms down, there was a backup of everything. Yeah, it's almost funny. We tell our clients today, back up your data, right? Everyone had back up your phone. It might get pickpocketed and then you're stuck. Back up everything. The Germans were ahead of the curve. And in this case, the Dutch were ahead of the curve. They had everything backed up. So it was useless. The 12 of them were killed, including Karl, who is one of the few people in a Wehrmacht uniform to be recognized by Yad Vashem as a, as a righteous uh, among the Gentiles. So fascinating story. Okay, time is short. So we're going to go on to the, to the next point I want to make, which is... Justice and memory uh, and the sensitivity with data, which I just tried to highlight in just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to go to the, to the second message here, which is justice and memory should always trump data protection. And that's hard, and I'm going to justify it. And my third part is going to be to explain how we do that technically, legally, how that can be done. You know, GDPR, we've all heard of GDPR. How do we do that? For now, I'm going to say justice and memory. I'm putting them together for now because... This is 15 minutes, not three hours. <laughs> We're good on time? Okay. They always trump memory. They always have to trump uh, privacy. And now this is a famous case. I, I presume most of you recognize this as being vaguely familiar. This is from Abu Ghraib. 2008, the American prison in Abu Ghraib, Iraq, was, uh, there was a whistleblower who produced evidence that prisoners were being tortured unlawfully in Abu Ghraib. That in itself is terrible. There's a great movie. You should watch it. This is one of the pictures. This guy is actually a completely innocent Iraqi civilian. Um, and what happened was the following. The whistleblower, a member of the US Armed Forces, produced evidence that this was going on and that was published. But then there were pictures, I think maybe 40 or so pictures, and the Department of Defense in the United States tried to block the publication of the pictures. The ACLU went to the, got all the way to the uh, to appeals court, said, we have to publish them. That has to, be, has to be known to the world. The Department of Defense said, what about the privacy of the victims? What about this guy's privacy? To which the court said, did he claim his privacy? He didn't claim his privacy. Why are you claiming it for him? Don't, don't claim it for him. Let him claim his privacy. They made another very important uh, uh, point, which is privacy? That's de minimis. There's an elephant in the room, OK? There's an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is you're torturing prisoners, innocent people. Privacy is dwarfed. It's dwarfed by the issue here. And the issue is, in this case, unlawful torture. And third, they made an interesting point as well, which is that it's, um, here they quoted uh, Brandeis. I think I have a picture of Brandeis here, Louis Brandeis. He was the author of the, the most important law paper ever called uh, The Right to Privacy in 1890. So he kind of invented, with Warren, he invented privacy in the modern era. And he's also most famous for saying, he was actually quoting someone else, that, quote, sunlight is the best dis disinfectant. He was, he got to the Supreme Court of the United States, he was there for many years, and he was the champion of transparency, of letting everything out. He said, that's what brings justice, and that's what brings, uh, that's what brings truth. Truth brings justice. Louis Brandeis, really important guy. So... He was quoted, now I'm going to put up some disturbing pictures here, okay? The, de, the, the court said to the Department of Defense, don't claim their privacy. But by the way, in 1945, when the American Armed Forces, you, the Department of Defense, liberated Buchenwald, you took pictures. And when you took pictures, you published them so the whole world should see. And you were right to do that and you weren't concerned for their privacy because the issue was so big and so important, it trumped, it completely crushed, quashed any importance of privacy. This is a picture from Buchenwald, from Liberation, on the Day of Liberation. This man is completely naked, and of course the Department of Defense published this picture because it doesn't matter, so we see him naked. This guy just spent years in, a, in, a, in, a, in concentration camps. 
You see, he's actually taken off his trousers. He, he was even, he was dressed. He has taken off his clothes for the pictures because it's so important to see how emaciated and starving he is. Here on the left is a very, it's a disturbing picture. You see naked ladies here. This is from the few very rare pictures that we have from the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz, 1944. We have pictures of women being walking towards the gas chamber. People died in order to be able to smuggle a camera in and out of the Sonderkommando division in, in Auschwitz. It's one of the few pictures that we have. These pictures are of epic importance for justice and memory and healing and truth. And data privacy is just completely unimportant in that context. That's the second, that's the second point I'd like to make. Now, last couple of minutes, I'll just speak to the notion of how, how do we get there with GDPR? I'm not sure that we're all GDPR practitioners. This is my specialization and that of others on the panel here as well. And uh, I know that they'll be speaking to that a little too. So I'll, I'll, I'll focus just on one point here, which is, uh, I'm gonna suggest there's what's called a legitimate interest. Article 61F, for whoever's interested in GDPR, says that where, it, that where there's an interest in publishing, what's called a legitimate interest, and there are cases, the Rigash case and others that explain what does a legitimate interest mean. So whoever really wants to get into the legalities and technicalities, I'm happy to elaborate. I'll just say here for now, there is a legitimate interest in publishing this data. Now this step, what I've just said now is uh, kind of mind blowing in some contexts and people, some will not agree, many archives, many institutions, many, uh, many collections of important data found that impossible to believe. They feel that data has to be protected unless someone consents to the data being published. I argue, and I have argued, and I will continue to argue, like the, in this case, the American Supreme, uh, Supreme Court, that that is dwarfed. The, the, the legitimate interest in, or the interest in protecting the privacy of individuals is dwarfed by the importance and legitimate interest in publishing this information. Now, just to illustrate that a little, to me it's obvious, I assume that everyone in the room kind of agrees because we're here because we care about memory, so that seems intuitive to us. Um, to the Arlson archives, for tens of years, this was not accepted at all, for example, and to this day, we were just discussing before the panel, many institutions do not agree with it at all. So I'm gonna share some anecdotal evidence. I've discussed with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, with Arlson Archives, with Yad Vashem, with the Wiener, Wiener Library in, in the UK, with many other institutions, and I have anecdotally spoke with, spoken with many Holocaust survivors. How would you feel about this data being published, about your records being published, about your photos being published? They have had zero complaints. Yad Vashem put its entire archive online. Arlson Archive has gone 100% online. All of it is being put online. How many complaints do you think they've received? Not one, not one. No one cares. It's not that they don't care, let me take that back. They care very much that it should be published as widely and as, as extensively as possible. So I could demonstrate that. I had a quote here that, no, I had a quote here that uh, made, no, I didn't. Okay, here. This is from Elie Wiesel. He needs no introduction and the sentence is a good one and with this I'm gonna end. The survivors wanted to communicate everything to the living. It is their, their legitimate interest of survivors, of their families, of heirs, of society as a whole, that as much of this data should be published and uh, as widely as possible. How exactly we do that, I can get into the details with whoever's interested. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Ahora vamos, sí, te picas aquí mejor. Now I'm going to give the floor to Antonio Gonzalez Quintana and to introduce him. He has got a degree in history, um, a degree in economy and document as the president. He's a member of the Ar archivists of the state. He's been the sub general director of archives of the of Madrid community during the year 2010-2018. Previously, amongst previous 
professional uh, positions. He's been the head of the unit of coordination of military archives of the Ministry of Defense and the director of the uh, Civil War Archive in Salamanca. He's a member of the executive of the World of, of Directors of the International Council of Archives, and he's also been an associate teacher at the University of Salamanca, and he's got, uh, he's published several articles on the right to access to information, amongst others. He's the author of the book, uh, Archivist Policies for the Defense of Human Rights, and he's also the co-author and co-editor of Archives and Human Rights, published in Rolets last year. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am very happy to participate in this meeting, and I have to be thankful to the Observatory of uh, European Policies of Memories and the University of Lonai and the Secretary of State of uh, Democratic Memory to have, for having invited me to participate here, to speak into the microphone, because a bit even more. Okay, good. Thank you. The right to truth and the right to knowing on the one hand and respect to the privacy, private life on the other. In that apparent dichotomy, we can summarize a conflict that is present uh, for, and that has been present for many years in the daily practice of uh, documentalist uh, work. The work that we are facing from the need of uh, combining the right to access to information with the uh, data protection, a collision between two fundamental rights and gathered in the Universal Statement of Human Rights, Article 19, freedom of expression, and therefore freedom to uh, ask for and receive correct information, true information, also Article number 12, respect to, to private life of people, uh, inviolability of uh, uh, male uh, correspondence that would be further expanded to, to, to go beyond postal uh, correspondence and in to include email. Well, uh, archivists um, and documentalists that have worked with uh, materials relate relative to the recent past, traumatic past. Uh, historic uh, memory. Well, we always liked article number tw uh, 19 versus uh, nine, number 12. We understood that the data protection was an, it was an obstacle in the multi multiple obstacles that we had observed during our lives to have access to information about the systematic violation of human rights in Spain. And the very same perception exists in countries that have had a similar transition to, our, uh, to ours. In that ensemble of obstacles, the appearance of um, the law of data protection of personal character of 1999, remember that when this, was, this protection uh, was exp expanded to the, the whole life of, of people, well, that meant a total collapse of our famous article of a his historic um, heritage. And that meant that if the person was a public person, uh, well, you could not publish any information for the, the for 20 years after he or she was dead. But now we can skip that hurdle. The so-called right to for forgiveness for uh, to oblivion. Many archivists interpreted mainly in Spain as the final uh, hit. to have full access to information for the knowledge of, of truth. We, well, we now can eliminate documents a la carte because Article 17 talks about the data suppression, the elimination of data, quote unquote, the right to forget, or to forgetting, or the right to oblivion corresponds to, uh, or the right to be forgotten in English, which is not uh, one thing is the right to be forgotten, the other is the right to forget, which is completely different. I want to forget that I belonged to Falange Española de la Jones, and I was a candidate as someone pretended to, to, to do. It's not a joke, it's a real example, which is which was the, the belonging to the fascist party. I will try to 
present uh, the apparent dichotomy if we analyze this coldly and seriously. Both rights can be uh, totally compatible. And the European legislation, which is an advance in human rights, does not involve what some intend to see. The capacity of showing a bi personal biography a la carte, forgetting what I want to forget about, what I don't want to be known about myself, and then strengthening the positive aspects of my uh, CV. The evolution of Article Number 12 of the Universal uh, Statement of Human Rights, talking about the respect to human and private uh, human life, is further expanded in the International Framework of Human Rights. I would start by talking about the uh, Tehran Conference that took place in 1968, 20 years after the approval of the Universal Statement of Human Rights, Declaration of Human Rights, to make a balance of these 20 past years and also to observe new challenges in, for the future in the protection of human rights. And one of the challenges is precisely the right to limit the use of technologies or in the intervention so that the use of technologies, which were uh, you know, beginning to, to appear in the, by the end of 1960s, could, so that this technology could not be used against human rights. Okay, the, uh, the the end of that movement that started in Tehran was the general regulation of data protection of the European Union of the year 2016 that was enacted in the year 2018. And we should understand it as such. We should limit the use, the capacity that new technologies have to go against citizens with, the, you know, with evi through evidencing their own data. Uh, with parapol police or, or police uh, activities. In that respect, I believe this is a real advance, the European regulation. And to simplify that we don't have such a contradiction, I would uh, speak of Louis Joannet, uh, was the father of the first reports that uh, were, uh, appeared in the UN in the conference of Tehran, speaking about limiting the use of computers in the access of personal information that can use against people. And he prepared a report in 1983 about this, but he's the father of 90, in 1978 of the French legislation about uh, freedom of computer science and the uh, access of information in, in, in his country with a law of 1978 between 78 and 1980 in France, several very important laws were created affecting the access of inf to information and the protection of personal data versus the uh, computer abuse. Le Janet uh, was also the uh, rapporteur about the right to truth, the right to knowing, and the struggle against impunity. The principles called Louis Joanne to fight against impunity are essential in the promotion of uh, knowledge of truth and are the first official document of uh, a body of a rapporteur of the UN, of the UN speaking about the importance of keeping uh, records and using the records to, to, to know the truth and to know what happened with my relative, my friend, with my uh, father, my mother, which was a generalized demand, knowing the truth in societies that were traumatized particularly by these events. I believe that Joanne, <coughs> having been the rapporteur of the UN for the struggle against impunity and having been the rapporteur of the UN against the abuse of computers in the use of personal data, exemplifies that these are two perfectly compatible rights that add on, not subtract. And they are uh, sometimes uh, facing one uh, with the other. Maybe in the sphere of uh, societies that uh, had uh, a traumatic past, maybe uh, we will have to underscore the fact of, of, of you know, the fight to have access to information while relegating the aspect of, of data personal the, the access to personal data protection. But we have to rescue the names of the victims of repression and the violations of human rights as are a 
mentioned just a few minutes ago. Very particularly in the case of forceful disappearance of the people who were uh, killed and, and buried in uh, common graves with no identification whatsoever have been demanded that my name is not erased from history. This sentence was gathered uh, of the letter written by Julia Conesa just before she was executed in Madrid that was used as the title of a documentary and as the motto of uh, uh, the 13 roses and the 13 young communist women that were shot to death in the uh, Almudena cemetery in the post-war period so that their names cannot be erased from history. That was the reivindication that my name is not lost in history. That is the motto of the project called All the Names, proposed by the creation, proposing the creation of a database of people who suffered the effects of, of a Franco's dictatorship in the north of Africa, in Spain, in the year 2001. And similar expressions can be found in countries that suffered or went through similar situations. After in 1954, in the Yavashen Museum that we heard so much about, oh, 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 guided us to, to, to try to find the names of uh, the victims of the Holocaust. And the dissemination of these names of crimes of lesser humanity has characterized the public policies of memory. The Hall of the Names of Yalbasen with over 4 million uh, testimonies are a clear proof of this. And the wall of the names in Villa Grimaldi in Argentina, well, I'm sorry, in Chile, paying homage to the people that were retained, killed, or uh, arrested through the torture of that clandestine center, 241 names of the people that died there. One of the goals of the numerous commissions of the truth in Latin America generally was, and the clearest example are the Erdish and Valles commissions in Chile, is to build a complete list of all the victims. Sylvia mentioned it this morning. This has been the uh, goal uh, they have in Argentina, followed by Sabato, paying homage to them, creating a, a single uh, rec uh, registry in Colombia with uh, over a million and a half names is one of the goals uh, for the peace and that was present in the law of victims and the restitution of land in of the year 2011 all the names is the portal as i said of the andalusian association working to, to uh, achieve recognition and so the ministry of culture created the portal of victims uh, of uh, the civil war in spain with multiple lists of victims in essence to uh, give, uh, to shed some light to these names uh, is considered as something positive that victims wanted, as we could hear in uh, the previous intervention. I would like to use this opportunity that I, I now have to mention the importance of institutions such as memorial in Russia that was uh, the beneficiary of the uh, Nobel Prize of Peace of the year 2022 together with Alex Bialiksky from Belarus and the centers of, of civil freedom in Ukraine, a memorial that uh, recuperate the names of people affected by the Stalinist repression, the, uh, re the repression of communism. Uh, this is the clearest example of an aggression to uh, uh, the, the, the archives of an NGO in the last uh, years from the Russian government. This institution was prosecuted, persecuted and has been limited in all its actions. Well, to, uh, the attitude of uh, the uh, of legislatures in, in Europe after the Tehran Conference on Data, data Protection uh, well, ends with the, the, the article that I will uh, used to, to finish my intervention. The erection of archivists, considering the right to be forgotten in Europe, is extraordinary. In the year 2012, the first uh, draft uh, of this European regulation of data protection was presented, and the French archivist realized that there is an article that speaks about the possibility of eliminating the names and personal data at the request of uh, those that were interested 
Well, uh, said that it was impossible because they thought that he could eliminate from history practically all the data that people wanted to uh, voluntarily uh, erase, erase. And the erection of archivists in these two associations you can see on the screen, and that we will see now the the French uh, Association of Archivists and the National Association of Archivists of uh, Italy, echoing the recommendations that the International uh, Association of Archives made, as we could see in the previous slide, if you could analyze it, in its basic principles on access, in its ethical code uh, from Beijing, and the basic and several principles about the role of archivists in the defense of human rights considering uh, the protection of privacy and also the free access, try to balance both issues. The mobilization of archivists, remember, uh, uh, campaignchange.org, uh, that got over 150,000 uh, signatures, mobilized the French authorities that uh, asked in the European Council of National Directors of Archives, uh, they called a meeting to uh, express a joint uh, position and that action, that lobby that was uh, uh, created uh, achieved the approval of the ex archivistic exception, which I believe is extremely important. The regulation of data protection of the European Union, in fact, in its article number 17, states that those that are interested will have the right to eliminate the data they consider under the following circumstances, data that are not necessary, the interest withdraws its cons his or her consent, and the treatment is not according to the regulation. But finally, that very same regulation introduces the exception, the archivistic exception, which presents the fact that, as we can see in the next slide, Chapters 1 and 2 of Article 17 that I just read, and they will not be implemented when the treatment is necessary uh, for public interest and re scientific or historical research or uh, statistical work according to Article 89.1, which uh, presents how uh, we have to do all this work. But uh, let, me, let me point out it's element 158, which uh, gathers to the principles that are very important, the uh, right to archiving and the possibility of knowing the truth of severe uh, violations of human rights. That element that, that whereas should be also applied to uh, personal data considering that it should not be implemented uh, on people, dead people, public or private organizations that manage documents of interest have to be services that are forced according to the rules of the European Union to maintain, evaluate, organize, describe, communicate, promote, and disseminate documents of durable interest while facilitating access to these documents. This is what I call the duty of archivists. This is the delegation of states to make these documents accessible. But on the second paragraph, it states that the member states also have to be authorized to establish the tre uh, further treatment of personal data uh, in order to use them uh, in the archival practice, for, for example, uh, to know the specific behavior under totalitarian uh, states uh, and political, uh, well, not only uh, victim census, but also the possible the possibility of creating a list of perpetrators. We've seen that in Poland, in Romania, in other countries, mainly those that use the archives of the state security with a greater capacity or the greater severity. I believe that the, the, the debate about the right to be forgotten, if we analyze uh, the rules, makes not very much sense unless the famous sentence of Google against Spain, or Spain against Google, I'm sorry, <clears throat> we'll hear more about this. And this was implemented right before the regulation had uh, been approved in the year 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 2019. The right to be forgotten was used differently. So eliminating from uh, information about a person from internet, uh, that he disappears uh, from the lists when Googling it 
or when uh, using uh, other search drives, which is not exactly the same as we analyzed with respect to Article Number 17, the right to elimination of data. And this is something that really worries me. Let me finish by quickly saying that all the element of suppression in, in Google, there's the form and the data, the data suppression agency also offers another form that you can use to uh, to, re to, to, uh, to request the uh, erasing of that information from uh, the search engines. Google or any other search engine can do that. And this is allowing a, a business that poses some ethical considerations here. I have a quick uh, search, two websites in Spain. The first one, Google Clean. It says, change your future, live the present without being conditioned by your past. The other is, we erase you. We erase it. Yes, te borramos. Yes, we erase your Google results disappearing from the internet. Is your right? And I'll stop here. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Antonio, y sobre todo gracias por tratar de ajustaros a los tiempos. Thank you, Antonio. And now give the floor to Jesús Rubí Navarrete. Voy a pasar la palabra ahora a Jesús Rubí Navarrete. Jesús Rubí Navarrete es abogado. Who is a lawyer? En su larga trayectoria ha sido director del gabinete del ministro de Justicia, secretario general técnico del ministerio de Justicia. Department of Law, the Ministry of Justice. He's also been a member in the court for competition between 99 and 2002. He was deputy for the head of data protection of Spain and general subdirectorate sub for data protection for the same institution. He is now working on institutional relations for the Spanish Data Protection Agency. He is also authored several articles on administrative procedure, procedures and data protection. He works at different Spanish universities and he works at international projects in cooperation with other European and world authorities, for example, in the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Israel, Croatia, etc. Whenever you want, sir. Muchas gracias por la. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. This is a thrilling subject: democratic memory. From the point of view of data protection, the law on democratic memory is an absolute innovation within the GDPR, which has already been mentioned. Why? Because uh, the GDPR demands that the rules on processing private data means that they have to analyze that content in order to treat it, to process it, which means that the reports of the Spanish authorities of uh, data protection demand that there is an article or an added clause which contemplates the provisions of the rule and translates it into the categories of the GDPR, identifying who is responsible for processing data, what for, what are the legal foundations, how can rights be exercised, whether there are limitations, etc. The first law which incorporates a clause on this has been precisely the law of democratic memory. I cooperated with the Ministry for Presidency to work on this clause because they had no idea, but none, really. This is a clause which is uh, fascinating, and it gives us legal precedent. And it responds to many of the risks and implications that have been mentioned when talking about the GDPR. This uh, tense added clause to the law um, well, there is a very simple say, way of saying that the GDPR needs to be complied with. And it says, in all of this, the GDPR will be applied. But this contributes no legal uh, certainty and no clarification on the practical consequences of each of the rules, on, which are very varied. So in this law, there was this exercise of actually developing the whole thing. So general reference is made saying, yeah, the GDPR needs to be complied with. And then they analyze the implications of the GDPR on all 
that is established in this norm. So there is this added clause, which is really long, and it starts by analyzing the registry of victims. They identify the goal of the processing, which is to handle the public policies of moral reparation and the recuperation of the memory of the victims, which allows for wide processing of the data. They identify the processor and the person responsible for the processing, which has been identified not for this law, but before. So public interest for archive purposes or statistic goals. This is one of the legal bases and the public policies for the recognition of victims and reparation and no repetition of these circumstances. So there is a clear identification. So there is a clear identification of the legal basis and they uh, identify how data processing can be done according to this legislation. Then there is legal habilitation for the publication of data for historical and scientific research. And there is a principle of data minimization and description of the data which is to be processed. Uh, there was somebody who's uh, who went to court saying, asking for his right to be forgotten. And his right was denied in this case precisely for this, for public interest linked to the legislation of uh, archival use. And then talking about sources, they mentioned the different sources where data can be obtained. They cover the obligation of the processors of all this data. They have the obligation of making sure the data is accurate in compliance with the peculiarities and specificities and restrictions of the sectorial regulation of archival data, which is a specific regulation within the GDPR. There is a demand to facilitate information on private details complying with Articles 13 and 14 of GDPR. Article 13 is the information provided when data is obtained directly from somebody, which is very simple to provide information, and 14 when they are not obtained directly from the person. In order to facilitate compliance with Article 14, they enumerate the measures that are suitable to facilitate this non-personalized information when it is not nominal. It is information which appears on a website or something where you can obtain that information. And then on data preservation, once again, the specific law is applied, which is the Spanish Historical Heritage Law. As for safety measures, just as for anything else to do with public administration, this is the general uh, safety uh, diagram which is applied. Uh, the GDPR does not contemplate the exercise of this right by relatives of the deceased, by na but national institutions can. And Spanish legis legislation actually says that some relatives in some circumstances can exercise these rights. And in particular, in this regulation, they limit the exercise of the right to be forgotten to facilitate the rules that we mentioned before in order to guarantee public interest, the right of the victims, and the right of society in general for rehabilitation and the rights of the victims. So uh, data protection regulation is not applied to the victims for this. Then there is also a mention of the victim census in Article 2, 3, and 4, 9, 2, and 3. They, rec they established the legal basis for processing, then it says that it is basically public interest in order to do scientific, statistic, and historic research. 
for everything covered under the law, the recognition of victims and recovery of historic memory. So it is a social function. It's not even linked to the people directly related to victims. Public access is established, and the person in charge of processing, uh, apparently it wasn't clear at the time who, which ministry was going to be, to be and it said just the ministry who has the competence on the matter. And on the exercise of right to be forgotten, the same procedures as before. As for the DNA data bank, they also identified the person in charge of the uh, processing, which is the National Institute for Toxicology and Forensic Science. Legal basis, public interest for historic research and uh, quests for disappeared people. Uh, the goal of the treatment and the goal of processing of data processing is to receive and store DNA profiles to compare them with the genetic identification of the victims. And in order to do that cross-referencing of data, the minimum possible data has to be used to obtain an efficient cross-reference. So biological samples from relatives is specifically admitted. The legal foundation in this case is different. This is informed consent. It is the relatives who themselves who had to consent to having DNA samples taken for this cross-referencing. Processing, data processing goal is the same as before. And preservation, there is no time uh, limit. It is indefinite, as long as it takes to carry out the required procedures. This is a very generic description of the purpose. There is no time limit. Data can be preserved widely as long as it takes. And as for data uh, session, they identify who can see the uh, data, the labs. Here, the legal foundation is not public interest, but something which is reinforced, which is the compliance with legal obligation. You have, uh, you need to have this uh, fiscal identification and the exercise of rights is uh, in compliance with GDPR in this case also taking into account historical heritage requirements. So this is the first additional clause which is truly innovative because it describes all the implications of the GDPR, the data which is to be processed, uh, who is going to process it, what for, in a particular matter which is very delicate and which contains sensitive information and which has to serve as a model and as an example so that these added clauses can be widely incorporated to GDPR. But as a conclusion, let me finish by saying that in this case, the right to be forgotten from the Google ruling is absolutely redundant. It is not relevant because this is right to be forgotten, what we call the right to be suppressed uh, for the suppression of links to have access to websites where there might be personal information through searches based on the person's name only, without eliminating the information on the websites and allowing the search engine to be used with other search criteria other than the name. But this is not to the point for this, because this is absolutely something completely different. This is not to do with the Google ruling, which also has limitations for public interest. But it is completely different from what we are discussing here with these databases. And with this, I finish. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. 
let me once again repeat my thanks to the speakers for being so clear and so respectful with your time management. We do have some minutes for questions from the audience, so the floor is open. We want to hear you. First of all, congratulations. This is a very complicated subject, and nevertheless, your passion has been clear, most inspiring. Today, we are at the model prison in Barcelona. In this prison, there were many victims of dictatorship, of repression. Many of the victims, I don't know whether we have anybody here from the Catalan Association of Political Prisoners. They were here with us this morning. I don't know if they're still around, but some of them who were victims of the dictatorship, they're still alive. Therefore, my question is, for Jesus and for Ari. So what happens with the recently approved law of democratic memory in relation to the victims who are still alive? But they are victims of the dictatorship. Can we or can we not publish their names? This is a question for Jesus, for the law that has been passed. And my other question is for Ari. I'd like to know your opinion, Ari, about what should be done with the rights of these victims who are still alive. Thank you. Let's cover a few, couple of more questions. I think there were other hands. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I was saying this morning that when we researched into sexual dissidents repression, we looked into the law for Spanish law that was used to attack homosexuals, the law for idlers and malfeasants. And then in the register in the Canary Islands, where we have the court cases for people who were uh, taken to court under that law, there is quite wide open access to those files. Really. You can really go all the way to 78, 1978. That's in the Canary Islands. Whereas in Valencia, in another part of Spain, all the files are anonymized. All the personal details are removed, and there are some access limitations as well. There are other cases in Spain, for example in Bilbao, where access is directly forbidden. So there is a huge discrepancy between archives in Spain, and supposedly we're all complying with the same regulation. So I don't know whether these added clauses can give us wider access. Also, bearing in mind that we researchers, we're not going to name names. We're just going to take data information about how homosexual people were repressed, for example. So I want to know how this uh, new New legislation can give us wider access to archives and registers. I mean, do we need specific regulation to give us simpler, more open access precisely to fight for historical truth, perhaps putting truth before privacy, as we heard before? Any further questions? If I may. Because I need to catch a train at 6.25, less than an hour. I'm, I'm really sorry because I was, I was late. But I, I was told that I had to go to the university, which is where you were yesterday. So I went to the wrong place. I mean, luckily, there was another meeting there. And somebody looked at me and said, hey, you shouldn't be here. And then, wow, I found out that. I should have been here. So I got here late, and I apologize, and I'm going to have to leave early, and I apologize for that. But at any rate, please let me give my comments. Um, this new law has a wide array. It covers different types of uh, data, 
and for different purposes, as I have uh, mentioned. It is to do with uh, the law on archive and documentation. It is those specific rules which take priority over the uh, rules that appear on the GDPR. So, within that, you can definitely have access to all that information by virtue of that added clause. Now, about that uh, Frankist law, Eidler, San Melfesans, um, there is actually a restrictive added clause that said that you cannot gain access to information on that. But that was something that happened in 1991, 92. So that's completely different from the current situation. Right now, the legal categories that have to be applied are purely those that come from the GDPR with the adaptations, uh, which is the true GDPR in the European Union. Uh, I mean, the new one for uh, IT data, uh, uh, that's not the one I mean. I mean, it's the Spanish adaptation of it. So we have to apply the categories that come from the GDPR. For this, as uh, we can see in this law of historical memory, which is a controversial law, yeah, we all know that, but from the point of view of data protection, it's quite complex. And it was difficult for us to uh, fit things in and to make sure that we covered all the implications, bearing in mind the kind of data that was going to be revealed and who could have access and blah, blah. So this added clause opens new possibilities related to data processing for, let me give you the right word, data processing for, I wanted to share it with you, I can't, oh, here you are, data processing with a, quite a wide range of purposes. It says public interest in historical research, which is what you were talking about. Also historical uh, statistic purposes and the recognition of victims and recovery of memory. But there are, there is also, hang on. It says, uh, uh, purpose of the data processing, to gather victims' data in order, in order to manage public policies for moral reparation and recovery of the victim's memory. So this is really wide. I mean, you cannot put everything in this, but it, it's a wide array of uh, uh, purposes. And it is adapted to the historical purpose of the regulation. And it makes it possible to gain access to the data and also to verify it. So I don't understand why there should be specific limitations within the, the, the law and within everything that is established in the clauses. I, I don't see why there should be any more limitations to gain access to data for cases to do with the law of idlers and malfeasants. And with this, I'm going to do, bid you farewell. And uh, thank you. No problem. <laughs> thank you for your effort. This has truly been a brief uh, <laughs> trip for you. Yeah, I, I do apologize. Uh, I'm going to give floor now to Antonio and then to Ari, so that they can answer the questions and give us their final comments. Apart from Jesus' comments, I'd like to be a little bit less optimistic about our possibility to gain access to those files, files for those idlers and malfeasants that we mentioned before. 
la, la ley de la memoria democrática, the, the, the new law of democratic memory a, in the three articles hace on un, una declaración genérica de que todo esto será accesible. It just says, yeah, everything will be accessible. Yeah, it will be open. Yeah, for everybody. But those generic statements, I'm not quite convinced by them because also in 2007, the historical memory law also said, yeah, no, everything to do with the civil war will be open according to current regulation. Yeah, but then we have, you know, current regulation. So, this is limited to state-held data, not under state-level held data. So, that to start with. And then, even with this uh, application of historical heritage law, we'd have problems. And I think many archives would still hold on to the personal data protection law and GDPR. They would still close the doors on those files, at least for as long as the people involved are alive. So I'm really sorry, but I think that's how it's going to be. There is a final clause, number eight, on the historical memory law that tries to save the day, but I'm quite skeptic on whether we are going to be able to implement that. That final clause, number eight, says that Section C.1, Article 57 of the Historical Memory Law in Spain, which is the one we're discussing, that, article, uh, that Section C says that documents which are to do with people's privacy will be open 25 years after people's deaths or 50 years after the emergence of the document. And the new clause says that, yeah, no, no, Section C, we're going to forget it if we're talking about historical archives. And that's the clue, historical. What is a historical archive if we don't even have a, a state common definition of a historical archive? That's why archivists' associations and memory institutions' associations have presented a series of amendments to the law. And we wanted to have all the funds in related and to have all the information from the law of idlers and malfeasance and uh, uh, war trials, to have everything covered, not just to have a common census for everything because that would be useless, but also because if you have a census, you have to say that everything is everything that's in that census can be open to everybody. Or else, what's the point? If you're just going to say that it is just going to be to digitize it and post it on internet, well, come off it. I've been hearing that for 40 years. That's just not going to happen. Thank you. Ari. Thank you. Um, a couple of comments <coughs> that address both these questions. Uh, Gerard, thank you. First, um, The, the, the discrepancies and the wide variation of the way different institutions are going, I'll just prefatory remark, I'll try not to repeat anything that was said here before and just add to it. Um, the, the, pre, the wide discrepancy between the way that different institutions will relate to data protection risks arises, I think, in large part uh, because of different risk tolerance different approaches and, and how willing they are to take a risk, the culture of the organization. So if you look at how the US Holocaust Memorial Museum works, for example, they have, um, how do we say, thorasos? They're, they're not scared of anyone. They have unlimited budget. They're, they're very bold. They've been very, very bold. And they have, uh, they have very powerful kind of lobbying um, uh, strength behind them. Just as an illustration, where uh, Yad Vashem in Israel is, for example, is, um, is backed by law, which, as Antonio discussed, that actually changes its status. And therefore, they can be very, very bold. Right? Who's going to sue? The, if someone wanted to sue, they could try, but they can be very bold. So a, a certain cultural shift has to occur among the different organizations. 
they have to go from feeling, oh, we're, we're holding very precious, uh, delicate personal data, which, which we have to be scared of being sued. And uh, around GDPR, there's been a lot of fear mongering, a lot of uh, fear development. Uh, it's good for business. 20 million euros, 4% of revenues, criminal uh, sanctions. Okay, forget all of that. Uh, we had a representative of the AEPD here before, but the fines are reserved basically for like Google and Facebook and you know, <laughs> uh, big actors in bad faith. There's, there's been almost, there's been very little in terms of fines and enforcement against um, uh, institutions acting in good faith. So there has to be a bit of a cultural shift among organizations. They have to be uh, less afraid and they have to be willing to take a little risk and so now I'll go to, to kind of practical steps. You say, what could be done with the data of people who are still alive? So many Holocaust victims are still alive. And a lot of their data is being put out there. Here's, here's my suggestion. Something to, this isn't legal advice, let's say. We can, okay. Here's a suggestion, a, 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 a thought exercise. If, if we're looking at GDPR specifically, because I'm not going to comment on the Spanish law, you have 61F, which is a legitimate interest, and when you publish data based on the legitimate interest, you balance the legitimate interest in publication, which in this case, as we heard, is in institutional, it's national, it's a lot of very important values on one side, and on the other side, we have a person who is alive, and what is the, what is the harm in, his, in publishing the data? So I said, it, as far as I can tell, in the case of the Holocaust, there's, there's no question in 99.99999% you know, of cases, there's an interest in publishing the data. I will give you an illustration, one or two cases that I've heard of in which people wanted data taken down. Okay? I know of a Holocaust uh, survivor who was afraid of Holocaust deniers and neo-Nazis in Northern England, and he asked for his testimony to be uh, taken offline, okay, but not erased and not deleted, just taken offline. Um, I know of a case of the family, not the survivor, the family of a survivor, the descendants of a survivor. A tragic story, she was raped by Russian soldiers after liberation, and that was in her testimony at Yad Vashem from the 50s, 60s, and when it was published online, they asked for it to be taken offline. Now, these are good illustrations of where, in that balancing game, suddenly you discover that there's something on the side of, 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 of uh, publication that is very harmful for the, uh, let's say, for argument's sake, for the person themselves, for the data subject. So if you have some kind of takedown mechanism, something to say, well, in 99.99% of cases, the interest is in publication. But actually, in this specific case, we, 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 we ought not to publish. We need to take it down. So be sensitive and take it down. So not, I'll give you two more illustrations that I'm aware of from the Holocaust research. One involves a doctor in New York who was part of the um, team reviewing Holocaust survivor claims. And when he passed away, all his files were, were given to a Holocaust research institution. Now, that included a lot of very personal details about psychiatric uh, harm, about physical harm to Holocaust survivors. If that would have been published, that would be very, very sensitive data. It's not this person was in Buchenwald in these years. It's much more sensitive than that. It's the you know, personal ramifications for their you know, bodies and souls. Another example is very similar to what you were discussing is um, a, uh, a database of people um, that Nazis, Germans had put in camps for, uh, on suspicion of being homosexual. That was also kind of recovered. And now he had a question, can we publish it? So the outcome would be that, I don't know, let's just say for argument's sake, 10,000 people, 10, people who are suspected by the Nazis of being homosexuals are now basically outed. Okay, some of them may have been homosexual, some may not be, some may be already out of the closet, so to speak, some may not be. But is it right for a Holocaust research institution to publish such data? Okay, it may be in this case we're looking at something that flips the other way. But in general, now how would you find, how would you prove that the general case is, you know, 99.999%, uh, you know, one in 10,000 cases is, is, is inverted, but the other, uh, the other cases are all in favor of publication? You could do a survey. So if you know that you have, say, 10,000 victims alive that you want to you know, survey, survey them, survey 100 of them. Go ask them, a phone call. I don't know, I don't know how you do a you know, good survey of that kind. Ask them, and then you have evidence 
that 99%, maybe it's 99.9%, whatever it is, are in favor of publication. Well, I'm done. I can, I can go on forever. Okay. So I think that's a way to actually to, to prove that you have a legitimate interest and document it. And with that, you can also change culture. Now, can I, I'm going to add one comment. Okay, I'm going to use that minute to say the following thing. I suggested this years ago. Um, maybe here in Spain it will be taken up. Pool the risk. Okay, if you have a few institutions who are doing this, put a few million euro in a pool somewhere. Okay, maybe have the government. Uh, I don't know who it is. Someone should indemnify the institutions taking a risk. What is going to happen? What's the worst that can happen? Someone sues for saying, "Oh, I, I was put in a panopticon uh, in, in, in La Modela. I, I, I was incarcerated there for X months, and and you published it, and I didn't want anyone to know." Okay, let's do a little thought exercise. Go to some lawyers and say, "What is our liability here?" What is the damage? What can someone sue me for? I don't know. Was it 5,000 euros? 10,000 euros? 100,000 euros. How many of those are there? There's 100 of them. Okay, now we know what our risk is. We can pull our risk and we can take the risk together and we can, we can quantify it. And now we change our, uh, our attitude. We say, okay, we have insurance or we have indemnification or we have whatever we need. It's pulled. Now we know what our risk is. Now we can publish it online and see what happens. We don't have to publish everything. We can start with a bit. Okay, done. <laughs>